Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Saturday, May 31st show for Classroom 2.0 Live. Today's topic is Reinventing Writing. Your show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. I'm Lori Moffitt. I'm speaking now. Tammy Moore, thank you so much for doing closed captioning for us every week. Our special guest is Vicki Davis, and her website is here. The Live Binder link is this one. And notice the tabs for the pages in the Live Binder are to the left rather than across the top. The top. The recordings are available at the Archive and Resources page. At this link, live.classroom20.com slash archive dash and dash resources dot html. Here is where I get to ask you where in the world you're logging in from. So go ahead and pick that pointer tool from the second whiteboard tool and click on the map. We won't see your choice until you push down on the map on the, yes, the slides are going forward. I don't have a red border. The slides are going forward. We usually have an international crowd. I see an icon in Europe. Most are United States. Here's our first polling question. And remember, you vote for these with the icon underneath your name in bold, right underneath the title for the participants window. Do your students write collaboratively together, yes or no? And it's it's the drop down right next to the hand icon. Laurie, if you have yes, be sure to pick pick the tool and not the image on the slide. The image on the slide near the word live is not an active tool. It's only a picture of the tool. Laurie, I see your, your hand is up. If you have a question, you can type it in the chat. And if you are logged in with an iPad, I see a lot of mobile devices um, you don't see the icons. They should be right under your name that's in bold, not the regular text name that is under the main room but under, right underneath the participant's title. I'll go ahead and post these to the whiteboard. And from those that voted, 53% do have their students writing collaborati collaboratively together. Second question, do your students use blogging or microblogging for sharing learning? You know, wait for people to mark their choice, and then publish. From those that voted, 41% do. 41% said yes to this. And our third question, do you use pre-writing graphic organizer tools, such as mind mapping with your students?
Again, I'll post those to the whiteboard. And from those that voted half do, half said yes to that question. Again, our topic today is reinventing writing. Our special guest is Vicki Davis. I'm Lori Moffitt, one of the co-hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. I'll introduce Vicki. She's a full-time classroom teacher in Camilla, Georgia. If you want to know what 21st century teaching looks like, many, including Thomas Friedman in The World is Flat and Don Tatscott in Grown Up Digital mentioned Vicki as an example. The ISTE Online Learning Award, EduBlog Award for the Best Teacher Blog are two of the many honors she has earned. Just this week, she was named the number three influencer online for BYOD. Vicki writes the Cool Cat Teacher Blog and hosts popular internet radio show of best practices for busy teachers, Every Classroom Matters, on the BAM radio network. Vicki's also a Google certified teacher and discovery star. And the newbie question for Vicki is this. What are the newer forms of writing besides traditional writing in schools that students should master to be an effective 21st century student? Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I didn't take that cue. I was so engrossed in the chat. Let me turn my video on for just a moment while all of you are putting your answers in the chat. Uh, good Saturday for those of you who, I think everybody, it's still Saturday. I'm really glad to be here today. And when you share what you're doing, um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm surprised how many of you uh, are already doing collaborative writing. It's a, that's a very high number. So this will be a great opportunity to really brainstorm and share some best practices. Uh, it's a unique opportunity we have. Also, a very high number of you are using some of these other tools. So please make it more useful for everyone by sharing links. Um, you are not bragging if you share a link to what your class is doing. Um, you are sharing best practices, and we would really like to see that uh, go on. We can um, save the chat later. Um, and in fact, I'll go back and save it later as well. And our back channel moderators are checking it for um, questions and such. So put your questions in there uh, as well. And uh, Peggy's done a great job on the live binder. I just love those live binders. I told her I was going to have to go through all of all of those. So many great resources. So let's go go and kind of answer this newbie question here. Uh, and I am going to turn off my video so that I don't slow down. For those of you who are on Wi-Fi, a video might do that. So I'm going to turn my video off. Um, but as I sat down to write um, my current book that's just come out called Reinventing Writing, um, it will be out in print in the next um, seven to ten days. Um, I kind of found um, nine different categories of collaborative writing um, in, in this new form of writing that's happening in the classroom. Um, when I took all the different ways that we write in my classroom and kind of divided them out. So um, we've got wikis and cloud syncing and blogs and cartooning slash infographics and e-paper and social bookmarking, collaborative notebooks and notebook taking, graphic organizers and collaborative writing apps. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about these nine different categories of tools. I'm going to give you ideas for what you should be doing in your classroom or in your school um, to kind of um, help you understand, okay, this is what it looks like. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's still people at conferences who sit around in a room and they have these thought leaders who say, this is what the 21st century classroom should look like. Well, there are so many teachers who are already there. Uh, somebody joined uh, the session earlier and said, does this apply to first grade? Well, my friend Karen Learman, who run the, uh, won the um, uh, SDK Bitter Award last year, um, is tweeting with her first graders with amazing results. So this applies to all of us, but we don't have to imagine anymore what this looks like. We can actually look at best practices that are already happening. Our hashtag today is Live Class 2.0, so if you share anything over Twitter, if you want me to answer a question later or give you some further information, if you tweet to hashtag Live Class 2.0, 
um, I'll follow those and answer those for this session today. Um, so you are part of this presentation. Please share in the chat. Share links to what you're doing. If you have questions, put those in there. If you see a question you can answer, answer it. We're crowdsourcing. Oh, this is even a new form of writing is this lovely chat, uh, which you might want to snap out and make bigger because it's going pretty fast. So answer questions. Uh, one note of etiquette is um, I am replying to Stella. She um, I just put it in the chat. She asked a question earlier. If they put use the at sign so people know who you're replying uh, to, so we can kind of do that. Um, and do welcome beginners. When you see somebody who comes in and says, you know, what's going on, or I can't hear, uh, that's everybody's job to welcome beginners in any in collaborative environment, including today. And any highlights or things that you love uh, that resonate, live class 2.0, I'll be retweeting some of the best. And I see lots of my friends here. Uh, Dr. Thomas Ho's here, lots of friends. So um, reinventing writing, what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover the nine ways writing has been reinvented, kind of give you some highlights, give you examples of the practical things students need to know, examples from classrooms and recommendations for each. I will very, very briefly cover the nine key P's for digital citizens. I don't have a lot of time to go in that, but I'll do it briefly. Let me tell you what we won't cover deeply today. I'll just hit, hit very lightly. Strategies for building writing communities. I have a whole chapter on that in my new book. The how-tos for how you use these tools. You can share links. You can um, uh, give each other how-tos and tips. But there are lots of resources for the how-tos. So I'm not going to get into that because we have a lot of tools to cover. There are 20 questions you need to ask when you pick a tool. You need to play 20 questions with your tools. I do not have time to go into those questions for selecting a tool. And then I don't have time to dive deeply into the nine key P's. Okay, so you're not getting that. Uh, but you will get the, get the nine. Um, but here's the thing, and, and if you look at, I did a recent show with my friend Richard Wells from New Zealand. Uh, you can follow him at iPad Wells on the SAMR model. And the, that four-step model, it's not really steps. It's, it's just kind of the different ways you can have technology integrated into your classroom. Um, I gave Peggy the link to add to the live binder because you'll definitely want to listen to that little 10-minute show there. And the last, or the R, stands for uh, redefinition. When you use technology, it truly redefines what and how we're doing in the classroom, and it should. You can't just take the way I've taught essays for the last 30 years and use it in your classroom now. You have to redefine. So what we're seeing here in the purpose of my book is to help us to redefine what does it look like? What does note taking look like today? Um, so there's some things we'll be able to use that we did before, and then there's some things that um, are, are new. Um, you can still do, um, you, you know, uh, writing groups, and there's all kinds of things you can do, and they can move online, but then you get some extra features that, that you want to get. And, and I actually had this example on here, the Gamified Project. This was a collaborative writing project my students did this year, and it was an intergenerational learning community with Dr. Lee Graham uh, and her students from the University of Alaska Southeast. And my ninth graders wrote with master students, and it was fantastic. Um, what they did, and we can truly redefine. In fact, I think every college classroom of pre-service teachers should have a way to interact online with classrooms that are in session uh, in schools around the world. Why, why talk about students? Why not talk with students? Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into all this research. I quote a lot of this in the book, but what you need to realize is that it's not just, uh, I'm not a big one for just the popular tool of the moment. I like to use what works. I like to use what uh, research says uh, works in the classroom. So a lot of what I do with wikis is based upon cooperative uh, learning research. Um, but collaborative writing, all of these tools can be used collaboratively or Solo. So remember, all, all that we're going to talk about, you can do this individually or collaboratively. Um, but when you have collaborative writing, which is really something new, you get, you get benefits. Students get audience. And you know, now, with, with collaborative peer feedback and editing, when the teacher gets that paper, it should really be on revision four or five. And the teacher should not be the only one providing feedback. It should already have gotten feedback and gone through several rewrites before it gets to the teacher. 
um, and we need to remember that needs to happen. Now, the one thing that has changed all of this and the reason that we're able to have this session today is because of the cloud. The cloud is just the location on the internet where common files are stored. Um, and that's all that, that it is. And, and the cloud underlies what we do. So if you don't have internet access, you can use some of these tools offline, but you're going to get more out of them if you can't access the, the cloud. Um, so reinventing writing. These are nine tools, and let's dive in. First of all, paper has been reinvented. We have e-paper. And we have ebooks. We have all these different types of readers. Now, I would love for you to share in the chat the way that you love to read, um, that you love to read ebooks. And if you are, now remember this this is not replacing paper. We still have newspapers. You know, a lot of people said all these online websites were going to kill newspapers. Well, they haven't. But newspapers have changed, and the online part has changed. So paper changes and the new tool changes, but we don't get rid of the paper. So sometimes you'll have a book that you still want to underline. Um, but do students know how to find and download books? Do they know how to open e-paper? Can they print to e-paper? Make sure that every single computer lab has e-paper installed, because you should be able to print to a PDF, uh, which is portable document format, the most common form of e-paper printing. Do students know how to annotate and highlight in their books and take good notes? Um, this, or can students pull those notes out and pull them into their notebook tool? A lot of people don't know that you can take those Kindle notes and pull them out, and those iBook notes and pull them out. Um, five most popular ebook readers right now are Kindle, iBook, Nook, Kobo, and Google Play Books. Now, Blue Fire Reader is a pretty popular one, too, that will kind of help you unlock something called DRM, or Digital Rights Management. Kobo is a new one on the scene. I think it's very important for you to realize that one is there because a lot of indie authors or independent authors are publishing on Kobo. And if you want to publish independently with your students or by yourself, Kobo is a great place to, um, to, to go and to share that and, and to do it. So Kobo is really an upcoming uh, place. It's got a lot of cool author tools and that sort of thing. So I have 10 favorite places to find, download, and read free and inexpensive ebooks. Of course, there's Project Gutenberg, free books, ebookish. I love Goodreads. Um, it should say Goodreads, actually. I'm going to be hosting a giveaway for the book on Goodreads. It should go live tomorrow and give away some books. A lot of people don't know that Goodreads has all these massive giveaways that they do. And you can sign up to get free books. Um, and you know, it's a really good way to, to get books and to talk and to share. So I basically add all my friends and all the educators I can find to um, Goodreads. It's a great network for people who love um, that, that stuff. Now, my favorite one now is actually BookBub. Uh, BookBub gives you free books every day, and it's just a neat um, website that, that just has all kinds of free stuff. And you, oh, I do too, Peggy. Peggy uses BookBub every day. Great one. Uh, a lady named Joanna Penn who hosts a wonderful um, podcast for writers that I'm sure I see my friend Wesley Fryer in there that he will like called the Creative Pen Podcast is the one that kind of got me on the book bump. Now, the last one I want to mention on this slide is Calibre. Calibre will reformat and convert to all different kinds of formats. So if you get it in one ebook format and you want to convert it to another, say you download a PDF and you want to turn it into a Mobi and put it on Kindle for your kids, you can go with Calibre. And again, thanks Peggy for sharing. She's such a great Google jockey. Um, uh, she uh, is shared the link to my epic ebook guide, which basically in one page gives you everything. So you can send that to your kids or your students and help them get started with ebooks. Now these are from my friend AJ Giuliani, these first five. Uh, and he has a great post that, that he's written on easy ways to publish ebooks with kids. There's Liberio, and the cool thing about this is you write in Google Drive and then you turn it into an ebook. So if you're writing collaboratively with your students, they can write collaboratively and then boom, there it goes to the ebook. Draft In is another cool one. Of course, there's iBooks Author, but you need to be aware that iBooks Author um, has special licensing that you give Apple. So if you want to take it, to another place, like put it on Amazon or something, you may be limiting your ability to do that with iBooks Author. So just be aware of that. 
Uh, there's Lean Pub, and you can even take PowerPoint keynote slides and turn those in. Now, my favorite new writing tool is Scrivener. I'm using it to create my, my third book. Um, and I'm going to self-publish my third book, not because I don't think my publishers are great, because I have had two excellent publishers, but because um, I want to be able to help others understand this self-publishing piece. So, you know, that's the whole reason I started blogging was to teach my students. So if I'm going to teach all of you how to really self-publish in a very professional way, then I've got to do it myself. I uh, love Scrivener, great tool, and if you write anything, even a PhD essay would be great for that. And the great thing about Scrivener is that the um, tutorials they have online are incredible. Like you don't even have to buy the book. The manual is so good. Uh, and no, Scrivener's not free. I think it's $28. Um, but did you know you can even export your notes from Kindle or iBooks into Evernote? Um, you can also convert any format in Calibre. And then you, students can set up their Kindle email. Now, this will be particularly for college students. If you have all of your students set up a Kindle email, you can actually email to that. Now, there is a very small fee involved, but say you're a professor and you're writing things in Scrivener and you want to make your own book and just send it to your kids' Kindles or Kindle apps. They can do that with their Kindle email. You just put them in a group in your email. You email that PDF, and it will all be on their Kindle. So that's a great tool uh, that you can use. So here are my recommendations for eBooks and ePaper. Number one, if you're a school, evaluate Amazon WhisperNet. Amazon WhisperNet will let you send eBooks to Kindles even that you do not own. Okay, So there's all kinds of things with WhisperNet that you can do. Do you create a place where you can distribute or link to free ebook content? Every classroom um, needs this. And you may even want to make a page. There's a new site that I just learned about I've been playing with called WibKey. And someone will have to grab the link there for us. Um, but you can actually have a page on WibKey where people can download all the free ebooks. Because one of the tricks is that the kids got to know where to go to download it. So you want to have a simple place to do that. The older kids need to set up a profile on Kindle.Amazon.com. That unlocks all kinds of features and the ability to extract your notes out. Learn how to export your notes from the books, particularly if you're a teacher, because there's also a hack that I share in the blog post I wrote about how to do this that will let you, if you give, say you put this in Evernote and your students have Evernote or OneNote, if they're on a computer or they're on, a, on an iPad, they can actually, uh, on a computer, they can click that link and it will open up Kindle on their computer and take them straight to that location in the Kindle book. Um, but make, <coughs> excuse me, make e-publishing part of what you do. And I'm loving seeing all these chats. I'm going to have to go back and look at all this. Now we're going to talk about reinventing note-taking. Now one thing I'm not going to dive into is a note-taking system. There are all kinds of note-taking systems that are already out there. I don't think the note-taking systems that are out there are really ideal. Um, I have a system that I use in my classroom and, and for me called PREPS, which is prepare, record, engage, ponder, and sync. Um, and I'll try to share that in the chat later, but I'll share that more in the book. So we're not really going into how to note-take. We're talking more about the apps right now. But students do need a method to know how to take notes. Now this is what happens, and this is why I realized that we had such a problem, is that students, many of them, excuse themselves from taking notes because they just take a picture of the board. And here's the question. They take that picture. Can they find it a week later? Are they studying it for their test? Can they find it when it's time for the exam, or did they delete it off their device? So. This is not taking notes unless they pull it in, unless they reflect and they engage and they ponder and they work with those notes in a way so that the information becomes knowledge. So they need to, to do more than just take a picture. Where are those pictures going? Yes, Peggy. And Evernote can search with an image if you pay for the premium version. You can put pictures in there if it's not premium. So if it's free, you can put pictures in there. I don't think it searches that. Um, as well. And yeah, you see, so you want to pull it, Paula. That's a great point. You want to pull this into Evernote. You want to pull it into your notebook. You want to do things uh, with that. So here are the questions. Do students know how to take notes? Are they transliterate in multiple media? A lot of people don't know that you can actually record using audio 
and take notes at the same time. Now, I don't recommend recording if your professor or your teacher is actually recording um, themselves. Say they're using Swivel, which is a really cool um, robotic recorder that you use with your iPhone or your iPad. I love it. I use it in my classroom to capture me. Um, but can they do multiple media? Can't, do they know how to pull in screenshots? Do they know how to pull in video? And then do they know how to organize and retrieve and how to share it with their friends and that sort of thing? And yes, Carolyn, there is a benefit to taking notes. Now, the students who are very high on the auditory, some of them actually need to make more eye contact with the teacher and watch the teacher's mouth moving and really engage that way. But for them, I recommend the live scribe pen. Um, it, sync, it can sync with Evernote. It's a great tool that you can use. So the two most popular notebook services are Evernote and OneNote. I think these are the two categories that schools should look at. I think every school should purchase a digital notebook service where all of their students and teachers can take notes in the cloud. It's very important that we do this, and we need to start making decisions and recommendations on this right now. And these are the two that, that I've really uh, honed in on that have the qualities we need that are multi-platform. And I'm big on BYOD or bring your own device. Every, it needs to work on everything. And some of these other tools that are out there are good notebook services, but they don't work on everything. Now, this is an example of just a quick, uh, of a quick note. There's all kinds of features in here that, that a lot of people don't realize. First of all, there's reminders. Say a student needs to review um, their reminders or to review notes from a class or whatever. They can come in here and they know exactly what they need to review every day. Um, you can search in very powerful ways. I love using shortcuts. There's a great uh, film tutorial called The Secret Weapon, and I hope that uh, maybe Peggy can grab it since she's doing such a great job, that really teaches you a lot about how to really organize um, um, Evernote. So it's something you probably uh, want to use in all kinds of great features in, in Evernote. Uh, there's even a, a cool app called Shoebox. Uh, that will send it to Evernote in some powerful ways that, that administrators and teachers may be interested. Um, so I don't know if you know that you can create checklists and files. Now this is um, actually my checklist for my keyboarding class, which is eighth grade. And what I did is I pulled in the actual documents I use. You know how at the beginning of the year you say, ooh, I've got to print this supply list. Ooh, I've got to print this letter. Ooh, I've got to do this or that. Well, I actually drag it all into Evernote. So my first day of school, I am ready to go. All I have to do is open these files and edit and that sort of thing. And you can paste links to it, but I actually put these files into my Evernote so that I can open it on anything. And now that we have um, Office, Microsoft Office, on um, our iPads, and I have Evernote on my iPad, it makes it even more useful because I can open all of these on my iPad, which is really neat. Um, so I do things that I only do once a year. I actually um, have a list like this, and I put things in there, and students need to know that too. Um, now this is an example of some lessons I did last fall, and I give students the link to my Evernote notebook for the week. I used to do this on Google Calendar, but now it's Google Calendar, the problem with that is you had to click on each day to get the notes and things from that day. Now I can just have one note and I can give them the link. I'll actually put a shortcut to the link in Dropbox so they can get straight to the note uh, that way. And then they've got all their handouts. They've got everything right there. and They don't have to go looking for it. Now the only truly collaborative notebook service that you can edit at the same time is OneNote. Okay, so you cannot edit Evernote notes at the same time. If you want students to truly take notes together, you're either going to have to do it in Google Docs and then copy and paste it into Evernote, or you're going to have to do it in OneNote. And a lot of people love uh, OneNote. Um, and this is an example of how I have some different students editing OneNote. You can do screenshots. And you can see here, I have them make tutorials and information on all the different types of, um, of, of websites for that. Now, the one thing, Laurie, you can use Google Docs for note taking. The problem I have with it, it is not truly a notebook service. So it's, for example, it, it just doesn't knit everything together as well. Um, and I know they're trying, um, they've got this little Google notebook thing that's kind of there in the background, but it's just not a very good piece. So even if I use Google Docs, I'll actually put the links to the Google Docs in my Evernote or whatever. Um, but there are ways to hack that. Um, so here's my recommendations for reinventing note taking. Number one, select an official notebook service for your school. Number two, do connect your students and your teachers in a way that it makes it easy for them. Now some people do this 
granted through a learning management system. Um, I think it's better to do it through a notebook, but you could do it either way. Make sure you can share notes, learn to capture, annotate, and find, for example, when I'm using OneNote, I'll actually take notes into OneNote on my board, or I'll screencast by writing in OneNote so that I have those screencasts captured and I can put in the notebook. And then see if students can find notes at a later date. So I'll I do file extensions in the fall, and I'll go back in December and say, hey, who can put their hands on the file extensions that we talked about back in August, and see who can find it. Because retrieval is, is vital. Uh, we need to be able to retrieve um, what we've got. Uh, now. One other note here is that we do need to teach computational thinking and, and productivity, and you can do that while you teach writing using ifttt.com in particular. Now, there are ways that you can set up email to send notes to your notebook. So Evernote and OneNote have this feature, and you do want kids to, to know how to do that. But you can also set up your copier to send scanned documents. A lot of people don't know that. You can use IFTTT to, to link your notebook to other services. And they added OneNote back three or four months ago. It was funny. Uh, Microsoft was doing so much to OneNote and all these other tools. Then I had to um, actually go, I got permission to edit my book back in March because they changed it to OneDrive. They did all this stuff, and I put it in the chapter on that. But definitely use IFTTT. For example, everything that I bookmarked in Digo with uh, collaborative writing, I sent it using IFTTT to a notebook in Evernote so that I could have it when I was writing offline. Do you add the browser plugin? The Evernote Clipper is great. Um, OneNote has one built in as well. Know how to capture screen picks, and Skit is fantastic for this. And you can actually take Skit into either Evernote or OneNote. It, it's really useful, and they have an app too. Um, you can also set up import folders for Evernote, not for OneNote. So I have a folder on my computer, and it's called an import folder. And I call, actually, I call it z-evernote, z-evernote. And the reason is I want it to sort to the end. I don't even want to look at it. But anything I want to send to Evernote, I save to that folder. And then when I launch Evernote, it rips everything out of that folder and puts it in. Um, OneTastic will do it for OneNote, but it's not really very easy to use uh, when I tested it. Um, collaborative spaces to edit, you don't have that with Evernote. You do have that with OneNote. So realize that there's trade-offs with each. Um, so there we covered that. Now let's move on to how note cards are reinvented. Now, you'll notice that I try to use the words that we've been using for the last 40 or 50 years. One problem I have with how we've done new technology is that we're trying, you know, we're telling teachers that everything is completely new, and that's a lie. Everything is not completely new. A lot of the stuff we've been doing forever is just reinvented. It's just changed a little bit. So I think we need to use words and terms that are a bit more uh, friendly to the average everyday teacher and less scary. So social bookmarking, which I'm calling the new eNote card. Um, or creating electronic note cards. Uh, my favorite by far is Digo. You can use it for kids under 13. Now, you can use Delicious, but lately Yahoo has been killing everything that they own in, in not so great ways. So I'm not crazy about Delicious. Um, you can set up Digo to send everything to Delicious and import from Delicious. So let's look at the new note card. I took a note card, and I do still very often use paper note cards. For my third book, I've got a ton of paper note cards. Um, it's interesting. I'm actually scanning those into Evernote when I'm done with them. But um, here's a paper note card that I used for this book with a Pew study on it. And you can see each of the things on this are now part of this electronic note card in Digo. But I've got some new things. I can make it private. I can say I want to read this later. I can cache it. Caching is great for when you're uh, grading, grading websites for your kids because it actually keeps a copy of the website at that moment. Um, and then you want to teach students how to summarize. One thing students do a lot when they make a digital note card, and even when they make regular note cards, is they do not paraphrase. And I always tell my students that if you paraphrase, you won't plagiarize. So paraphrase at the moment you look at it, unless you need to quote. Um, here you've got your hashtags, and you've got your recent tags. Now this is great. This is new. The stars show us new things. You've got your group dictionary, and this is a tag dictionary that came out of the educators group, which is a massive group of uh, educators who share. But you can also do this great thing called lists and web slides in here. So Digo, you can dive really, really deep into Digo 
uh, it's a fantastic tool. Some other things a lot of people don't know that it does. This is my daughter's uh, website she created in Weebly a, a year or two back. And I could write all over their websites using our private Vigo group and send them feedback. Um, and then, you, this is for researchers, you can actually extract citation reports. So say kids are, are doing all this research online and then they want to print. Well, don't have them print a thousand a hundred pages um, of everything. Have them just clip the parts they want, extract a citation report, pull it into Word or to Google Drive and print that out for you if you need it on paper. Um, and then you've got, of course, this group bookmarks. This is my physics of the future. My students and Aaron now are students in Iowa uh, researched um, Physics of the Future by Michio Kaku this year. And they research first because you want to research before you write. Um, and yet, Carolyn made a great point. Even when you paraphrase, you do want to say and give attribution. Uh, it's a great point. Now, the nice thing is these groups can give you tag clouds for what your students are finding. One interesting thing as I was preparing this presentation, look how many of these the kids are hashtagging now. So um, it's interesting. We do social bookmarking, but when we say tag, the kids think hashtag. And they are all using hashtags in Digo. I, I don't quite know why that's happening, but it's, it's happening. Uh, and I certainly didn't do it. So realize that is that is going on now. Um, so did you know you can automatically do a live post from Digo based on your bookmarks or the bookmarks of a group? For example, if you have a college class and they're all studying one thing, or if you have a group of second graders using Digo and they're bookmarking things, you can extract that and turn that into a blog post. Um, you can extract certain bookmarks using IFTTT. Um, you can have it automatically bookmark Twitter favorites to Digo for you using IFTTT. You can search your bookmarks. It's amazing now how many times I search my bookmarks. It's like, what was that tool that did that or this? Um, and then there are even tag communities and site communities. Now, site communities are fantastic. Say you have a blog and you want to see what people are bookmarking and saying about your blog. Type in the address of your blog on site communities and see what they're doing. Um, and uh, that's a great thing to do. So set a bookmarking group up for each of your classes. And you can use it with kids under 13. Go ahead and set up a tag dictionary. This is front loading the words so they kind of know the topics. Install the Digo plugin to add more features to the website. So you definitely want to use the Digo plugin. Um, so we're through with that one. Now let's move to cloud syncing, um, keeping an eye on the time here. I realized this past fall that I had not opened my filing cabinet in three months. And I wondered why. And it was because of these three tools, Dropbox, Google Drive, and OneDrive. Uh, OneDrive is, was renamed recently. It was SkyDrive. So I don't know how many of you just don't open your filing cabinet anymore. But these tools are fantastic. Dropbox is the best way to get video off of everything. Google Drive is the best way to write collaboratively. Uh, Office 365 has come a long way, though, in the last two to three months um, with OneDrive. So there are a lot of things that you can, you can do there as well. Um, but do you know how to save to the cloud? Do you know how to get files? Do you know how to move files? And here's what I do with my students. This is from the fall, and these are the tickets I used. You, if you want to save this presentation later, you can go to File and Save in Whiteboard and save it as a PDF so you can kind of see what's on these slides. But what I do is I do an amazing race with my students. And I have them move between all the different cloud tools. And I, I want them to be able to upload a Dropbox, go on another computer, take it out of Dropbox, convert it to Google Drive. Um, put it in OneDrive, open it on OneDrive on their tablet, and, and just move it around. So I want them to use um, all of these tools and be able to be very literate and, and fluent and really platform agnostic that they can move through all of that. Now, some people get worried that they're stuck. You're never stuck. It's a great tool called Mover.io that helps you move between all your different types of places that you could ever move, even SharePoint. Uh, so you can move all kinds of ways. Um, now, there's also, I, I have a shared folder for every single one of my classes. And that's where we share everything. You can have two gigs free on Dropbox. And what I do is I just keep taking things out of there. If we do a lot of videos, I'll take them out. I'll put them on a, um, a uh, hard drive, and we'll just keep on going. But 
I also have a folder at dropit2.me with a password. So if a parent wants to send me a picture, for example, for a senior slideshow, I'll give them that link and they can upload directly. And I actually have my students do that too because a lot of college professors do that. Uh, sort My Box helps you organize and move your Dropbox materials. It's great if your Dropbox has gotten out of control. If you want to use, if, if you can't use Google Forms or any of these other tools, you can use JotForm and it sends the form straight to Dropbox. Um, you can even make a website using Site44 uh, out of Dropbox. There's so many things you can do. Um, in Google Drive, you can install Google Drive like a Dropbox folder, but let me warn you, do not put your Google Drive inside your Dropbox, okay? You're going to end up double syncing and you're going to kind of have a mess, so don't do that. Um, but you can install it just like Dropbox. Um, I have found in, in some of you folks who are Google Apps for Education or Chromebook schools, let me know if this is still true, that when I had Google Drive installed last fall, it slowed my computer down significantly. So I stopped uh, installing Google Drive, but we still use it and upload to it. You can upload pictures. You cannot upload videos to Google Drive. You can set up shared class folders. So I have shared class folders for this. Um, and then we actually used it to collaboratively edit using WeVideo. And great website, becoming a Google Drive master that you'll want to do. Now, OneDrive is integrated with Office and Windows 8. You don't have to install it, but remember this trick. I actually have this listed as a school supply over the summer. Um, BTech Marlene, I'd be interested to know, used to you could not upload videos from your iPad or your iPhone. Maybe you're doing it from a computer, but you cannot do it from your mobile devices um, now. But uh, oh, from computer. Yeah, there's a difference there. Um, OK, let's keep going. Um, if they sign up for OneDrive, only three can sign up per day behind a one firewall, so I ask them to do it at home or on their mobile device. Every student who has a OneDrive account has a free version of Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Everything they save to OneDrive from school or home or wherever will appear online, and it's a very powerful tool. If I think all students really need to know how to do that because it pre does preserve a lot of the formatting. And we just don't use drop drives anymore because now they pretty much put everything in their OneDrive. Uh, that they have. So here are the recommendations. Set up collaborative writing tools with your students. Make sure that teachers know how to give text and voice feedback. Um, there's a great tool called Kaizena that you can add in to Google um, uh, Docs, for example. And then, of course, there's Adobe Breeze and there's other ones. But um, do put in um, your voice when you give feedback. Uh, because here's the thing you have to remember. A lot of your students who are weakest writers are also your weakest readers. And if you are writing all of the feedback, you're hitting them at their weakness. Hit them at their strength and give your feedback verbally so that they're not overusing that reading, writing part of them. And they can actually um, do a better job of doing what you're saying. Um, empower peer feedback. Do get your students using peer feedback. Now, I have a new tool I'm going to share that's not in this presentation called Pro Writing Aid. Um, I love it. And I ask my students to run everything they write through that tool. It will check up to a 1,000 words at a time. Um, and I actually pay for the service. It's 35 a year. And I use it to edit my blog and my books and everything. It's great. You can use it inside Word. You can use it inside Google Drive. And you can even use it inside WordPress if you have the pro version. Do train and connect everybody on these tools and teach kids how to convert of all types. So if they write it in one form, can they pull it into another? Um, Zamzar is a great tool that you can use to help with that. OK, let's, remove, let's move to essays. Now, I, it's so much more than the essay. But even, like I said in my book trailer that I recorded this week, even if all you have is essays, um, you, can, you have enough reason to want to use cloud tools for just the essay. OK, cloud tools transform the essay enough to just use it for that reason. So every single AP Lit teacher should be using Google Drive and getting peer feedback on term papers and improving their writing using that. 
Um, so there's Google Drive, there's OneDrive slash Word Office 365, and then for many countries um, who block some of these tools or don't have them, Etherpad. Um, we've used Etherpad when, when I went to China and we ran a conference there. We used Etherpad because we couldn't get Google, Google Drive over there. So if you're truly international, you may want to set up an Etherpad and include those schools from other places as well. Um, the students know how to collaborate and write together. This is a totally different form of writing. Um, I have to share some research in the book from my friend Justin Reich. Uh, from Harvard that he, he studied thousands of wikis and he actually used PB Wiki for this and he found that a very, very small percentage were actually collaborative. So I, I really think collaborative writing has a long way to go. Uh, and part of that is teaching kids how to comment. For example, the page should always be in final format and then you should put comments about the page as a comment. You shouldn't do it in the chat because if you do it in the chat, you're leaving out your partners who are not online at that time. So it's better to do it with comments than with a live chat, for example, in Google Drive. Now, if all your partners are there, you can use the live chat. But remember, you're not capturing that chat. So if you as the teacher want to see if they're giving each other feedback, you're not going to see it. That chat pretty much disappears uh, from what I understand. So in, in some of you, there may be something new. So please cor correct me if, that, if that's, but I think that's why most, um, uh, schools are shutting off the chat because it, it just disappears and you can't see what they're, how they're giving feedback. Do they know how to import, export, and upload? Do they know how to open it on multiple platforms? And do they know how to share? Uh, so if they create a Google Doc, can they share it with their friends? Do they know how to do that? So I also have a blog post that I know Peggy will share the link to um, called 15 Best Google Drive Add-ons for Education, and there are a ton of great ones. Uh, including Glyphy um, is a, a wonderful one. I've talked about Kaizena. You can do MindMeister inside Google Drive and even EasyBib. Um, so these are all different tools uh, and there are a lot of great ones out there. But you, you can also, don't ignore Office 365 OneDrive. And um, Office actually has the coolest new screencasting tool I've ever used called PowerPoint. It's called Office Mix and it's new. And that's an example of how they've leveled up. And it is the best screencasting tool. I mean, I'm, I'm moving away from Screencast-O-Matic and moving into Office Mix for everything. It's free. Yes, Maureen, it's totally free. So definitely want to use it. You just go to Office Mix. Great tool. Um, but you can, you can live chat. You can even call people inside using Link. Um, you can live edit Word and Office and all that. So if you're a total Microsoft school, you don't have to envy the Google, Google Apps for Education. You can go Office 365 and you can do all this stuff. You just want to have a good internet there um, as well. So Zanzar is the file converter you want to teach every student, every teacher, because it converts in every way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, so that's something you definitely want to be familiar with. Now, do they know how to set up their collaborative writing tools? Do teachers know how to give feedback? And we've already gone through these. Oops. There we go. Let's move ahead. Reinventing journals and book reports, uh, blogging and microblogging. These are all very important, and I've got to move quickly here so we can have a few minutes for questions. Um, do students know how to write first-person blogs? Do they know how to link contextually? Uh, hyperlinking is very different than citing sources. Um, there are some things you would not want to hyperlink that I would take points off for because it would take off the reader off track from the main topic. Um, but then I also look for dead text. If I have a student who's written a three paragraph blog post without a hyperlink, that's called dead text. And they will actually lose points for that because if you're writing online, you should have hyperlinks. You are only as authoritative as where you link and you need to have links to prove what you're saying. And do they know how to cite sources? Do they know how to select graphics? And are they transliterate? Um, you want to know, know how to do those. Now, this is from my friend uh, Sue Waters, who actually has a piece in the book. Uh, she's one of the um, people over at EduBlogs, which is a great blogging platform for students. But you have to remember that blogging is a cycle. Uh, evaluate, review, reflect, and revise. And I got this tip from my friend Teresa Allen. You want, for every blog post that my students write, I want them to comment on three. So for every blog post they write, they comment on three because you want to have the peer review to go along with the blog post. And if you're blogging more, you want, you're requiring more feedback from the group. So that kind of keeps it balanced if you have students doing that. Um, 
So microblogging, this would be like Twitter, but you can also do it at classtools.net um, even if you don't have access to Twitter. You can do it on Edmodo. So can students write really short updates? It's funny, I'm doing um, something on my blog and a big firm sent me 155 characters to be a tweet uh, for me to evaluate if I wanted to tweet that. I'm sitting here thinking, okay, 140, 100, you know, that's 15 too many. Um, so can they write short, succinct updates? And that process of doing it um, is, is a, helps them synthesize what they're really trying to say. Do they know how to find conversations? Do they know how to cite sources? And do they know how to give credit and build their PLN? Now, one interesting thing, uh, tip I'm going to give you, and this is nowhere. I haven't even written about this yet. But um, in the research, Dan Zarella of HubSpot found looked at what gets retweeted more on Twitter, and he found that tweets with adverbs and verbs in them get tweeted significant, retweeted significantly more than those with nouns. So you can teach adverbs and verbs through Twitter because of this one fact, which is really cool. And his name is, um, there's a great um, uh, blog post called uh, Sci it's Scientific Tweets. It's on the buffer post. If somebody's able to find that, that would be great. Um, and I'm seeing some good links going by, too. Now, class Twitter accounts open doors. Two of my favorites, and I think they're everybody's favorites, are Karen Learingman and Kathy Cassidy. Uh, some great blog posts on using Twitter in the primary classroom. And you can see these are some examples of really young classrooms who are tweeting and sharing and connecting in powerful ways. Um, but you can also use Twister. Twister is free, and it's on um, classtools.net, which Russell Tarr, a good friend of mine over in France, has made. Uh, he's a teacher, too. And they can create these without even getting on uh, Twitter. So it's fantastic. And he's even preloaded a lot of these pictures. So like Emily Dickinson, she's preloaded in there. So when you type Emily Dickinson, if you spell it correctly right here, um, then it'll actually pull the right picture for you, which is really cool. And the date does have to be historically accurate. So it's a great way to use Twitter, even if you don't have access. Um, so set up a blogging platform, encourage feedback and connection. Do find a quad blogging group for every classroom in your school. This makes blogging easy. Quad blogging is tremendous, great best practice. Um, micro blogging can communicate and connect with the world and do give your classroom a public platform to share somewhere, even if you're sharing uh, directly. Um, as the person who's tweeting, do give them a way to do that. Now, one of my favorite tools is the wiki. Um, do students know how to write wikis and solve wiki wars and cite sources? Can they embed and do they understand how to use the discussion tab? And, and one thing that my friend Justin found is you really want to have at least four turns of conversation. So now, based on his research, when I have students on a wiki, I'm trying to get four interactions on one discussion thread, four turns of conversation to really promote the engagement. Um, and Carolina WikiWar, unlike Google Docs, if you edit a wiki at the same time, it, the wikis are designed to track every single change. So one student may actually write over another student. So it's not simultaneous. Wikipedia is not simultaneous either. Uh, and we call them wiki wars, uh, but you, you need to know how to solve those. Now, this is an example of the Gamify Ed project, uh, which I mentioned earlier that my students did. And here they're evaluating all of these incredible games. And um, you can see that they actually used tags on wikis to organize the flow. So when it was drafted, they tagged it draft. When it went to the copy editors, I had a, it was like guilds. So I had copy ed, I had revision, design team looked at it in design, and then we had student revision, teacher revision, and it went all the way. And when we promoted and we tweeted. So if you have a massive site to organize, uh, you can do it with tags. And my students really perfected that. Uh, I was so impressed with them. And then here you can see a great example. Jason P. is talking here to Salambris. And there's this great conversation that emerges, um, which is wonderful. And then I interjected in here after my student came and got me. But this is actually a ninth grader interacting with a master student. And how much, and if you, t if you take the time later to look at this slide, you'll actually see how they learn from each other and how um, Jason shared this really cool website, getting tricky with wikis.wikispaces.com, which is the best website for hacking a wiki. Um, so there's Wikispaces, PB Wiki, or you can install MediaWiki, which is what runs 
um, the um, uh, wiki, um, Wikipedia. So a favorite group website creators, Weebly, Wix, Web, and Google Sites. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go real fast. You can use tags. You can set up private projects. I'm going to be at ISTE presenting with the Wikispaces folks about the really cool stuff in projects. It's a very uh, new, neat thing that, that you can do. You can have an ad-free site. You can comment in line like Google Drive, which is neat. And then you can even monitor engagement live with um, Wikispaces Classroom. Um, so do set up a collaborative wiki community. Write information together, especially with kids from a different worldview. Um, look, though, for multi-age intergenerational within your district. And have a platform to share your student e-folios as well. Now, brainstorming is very important. If you're writing to collaboratively, you need to be pre-writing together before you write together. So um, I love the graphic organizers at classtools.net, but you can even use MindMeister or Gliffy or other ways to brainstorm. Um, and then here's an example of how we're brainstorming with MindMeister. Uh, now, here's another cool tool um, that I mentioned in the book called Hackpad. Um, you can outline with Hackpad, which is kind of like a wiki plus Google Doc plus it's just kind of a crazy cool tool, but they're very useful, very stable. But you can outline in all of these different types of things. Um, and oh, interesting, Hackpad was acquired by Dropbox. It's an interesting one. Um, but do students know how to create mind maps? Do they automatically go into brainstorming mode when they know they have to work together, or do they just start writing? If they just start writing, that's a mistake, because your stronger writers will just take over, and everybody else won't write. Um, do also make sure everybody knows how to find past conversations and revisions. And remember, it starts with pre-writing. Um, and let's move ahead quickly. Almost done. So illustrations and scrapbooks. Uh, cartooning is important. Voice thread, infographics. I'm very excited about infographics. I love the new tool called Canva. Uh, I'm really big into that uh, and using that tool. Um, here you can see my friend Susan Ox Oxnavod um, just went live with a really cool podcast with her on my Every Classroom Matters show. And here she used um, Globster to organize all this stuff about her digital toolkit, which is a great um, uh, way to organize. But the students know how to do this. Um, infographics are so powerful. Uh, Canva, um, she just shared the link. There's a how-to um, awesome tool. Guy Kawasaki is the evangelist, so I know it's going to do well. But infographics, the students know how to read infographics and create them. And I love infographics because it's a great way to use writing and reading and history and science, and it's cross-curricular. Uh, so many things you can do. And I actually used uh, Canva to uh, send out updates every month. Um, I would, instead of writing long updates about what we're doing, I'm just grabbing pictures and using Canva to share that. And I even used it to redesign my header on my blog, uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, remember this. This is some, some features about blogging specifically. Captions under images are read 300% more than body copy. Uh, headlines placed below an image are read by 10% more people than headlines above. Never break the left margin. It makes people stop reading. I know that's different for when students are reading, but for blogging, uh, you don't want to break it. You always want to write or center align your, your graphics. And images should have one of two things, either story appeal or demonstrate something. Um, that's how you pick your images. Those are some of the guidelines. So do teach students how to create and select images. Encourage the use of infographics to tell stories. Help them visually organize their e-folios. And teach guidelines to promote Readability. Uh, so these are the nine tools. And we're only going to have about three minutes for questions. Um, and not much time for our key piece for safety and success. So what I would suggest that we do now is I'm going to leave this slide up for just a minute um, and let us go for questions to Peggy or Lori or Tammy, whoever is um, uh, doing that. OK, Lori, go ahead. Yes, I managed to capture many questions. Uh, let's go back. Uh, what's the Blue Fire Reader? You mentioned that early on. Uh, Blue Fire Reader is a tool that helps you um, uh, get past some of these Adobe DRM, digital rights management things. So it, it's just a it's a reader, and it's kind of one of those things that if you really get into ebooks and looking at stuff, you
may come up against some problems with Adobe Digital Rights Management in particular. Um, it's very restrictive and it only lets you put it on a certain number of devices. Mm -hmm. And Adobe, I mean, the Blue Fire Reader helps you with that. Uh, and it's an app. So I haven't oh, okay. had to use it a lot, but I've used it some. Go ahead. This question just came in. Uh, where would you start to scaffold these different skill sets? Where would I scaffold these skill sets? Oh my goodness. See, that's so much about the, the pedagogy and how you teach. And a lot of these links, I share the lesson plans for how I'm covering these different things. Mm -hmm. um, you you want to say, okay, what's first? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm actually redoing my own curriculum based upon, um, based upon what I've done. So I teach a lot of my stuff on Sophia. Now, I am not a flipped classroom. I co-teach with myself. I have a digital persona. So what I do is I record these videos, say how to use Excel or Word or take notes or whatever. And I record this, I put it in Sophia and they go through that with headphones on in class. And then my face-to-face -face person, which is the real me, um, walks around the room and helps the kids. So I'm literally team teaching with myself, if you can think of it that way. Um, so that what what I'm doing is I'm actually reorganizing all my lessons this summer on Sophia to actually go through these in order because the order I put it in a book is kind of a really good order to go in. You could bump pre-writing ahead. You could bump those last two sections at the beginning. Um, you could put that up there, but. Um, I would, here's the thing, um, and I didn't include my watermelon slide. I have a picture of a watermelon and say, you know, how do you eat a watermelon? You eat it one bite at a time. Um, and that's what you have to do with this. So what I encourage you to do is to pick three things from today, three and only three that you want to do next and nothing else. If you do those three and you want to do more, either get the book or come back and listen to this session on iTunes or however you listen to your Classroom 2.0 webinar and, um, and, and watch it again and pick another three. Uh, but you cannot do, you cannot change all at once. It's not possible. But I will say this. Uh, in the South, we say, when you're green, you're growing. And when you're ripe, you're rot. So you're either growing or you're shrinking. You cannot hold still. Just try to hold your arm straight in front of you for 10 minutes. It's not going to happen. That arm is going to be going up and down and up and down. And that's how you do as a professional. So you're going to have to either grow and try new tools or you're going to be declining. You're not going to be as good as you were. So um, that is uh, what I would recommend. Um, and, and the book, somebody asked earlier, the book is actually, I think, $32 um, for paper and is 27 It was temporarily at 19 for those who follow me on Twitter. Um, but OK, go back to you. I think we're out of time here. Uh, Mike has asked where to find this presentation. It's a good, good way to wrap up. It will be in the archives later on, Mike, and you can get it in a number of different formats. I think I'll go ahead and go through the ending, the closing slides, and then if I do have some other questions, Vicki, if um, you can answer them later, that would be great, but you don't have to. At this point, I'm going to turn the show over to Peggy for this slide. Thank you so much, Vicki. This has been fabulous. And I know we're all going to want to go back and watch this recording and pause it and then take a look at the links that you've shared with us in the live binder so we can really explore these amazing tools. We have some great shows coming up, and I just want to quickly tell you about them. Next week, Tony Plort is going to be with us, and she is going to be sharing some great iPad apps and accessibility information. She works with autistic students, and she has found some fantastic ways to effectively communicate with them and to draw them out. So uh, that will be great, June 7th. June 14th, Jeff Bradbury has an amazing show planned for us about ways to use Evernote in the classroom. That also will just be loaded with great tips and suggestions for using Evernote. 
And then on Thursday, June 19th, we're having a special webinar, and it's going to take the place of that Saturday webinar. LiveBinders is running a contest right now, as they do every year, for their top 10 live binders of the year. You can nominate yourself or you can nominate someone else's binder. And the focus is on e-portfolios. So if you're aware of a fabulous e-portfolio live binder, whether it's yours or someone else's, please nominate it for that contest. And then on Thursday, June 19th, the winners are going to be invited to come and share their live binders. And we'll get a sneak preview of all of them. So that will be Thursday evening. I'm thinking it's going to be 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, but it will be on our calendar. Then we're going to be taking off summer break. We'll all be at ISTE, or at least I hope many of you will be at ISTE. And um, we actually may be doing a live show. In fact, I'm almost positive we are going to do a live um, half-hour interview with TeacherCast and Jeff Bradbury. And that is going to be on Sunday, June 29th. If any of you are at ISTE and would like to be part of that live show, please come and join us. The room is going to be called the Fishbowl. So I don't know where it's located, but it may be the blog room. So look for it. It's not the bloggers cafe, but it's the bloggers room where you can go and sit and blog during the conference. So that's Sunday the 29th. Also, Reform Symposium is coming up, and that's a three-day free virtual conference from July 11th to the 13th, so be sure to take advantage of that if you're looking for some fantastic summer professional development. And then all of our regular shows will resume on Saturday, August 2nd. So we hope all of you will use the summer to go back and watch some of the recordings and check out some of the live binders. And then join us again on August 2nd. And I'm going to turn it back to Lori to finish the wrap up and tell you how you can get your certificate and uh, get the recordings. Thanks, Peggy. Steve Hargadon's newest venture is the Learning Revolution Project. He's pulled together all of his teacher PD resources into one place. Also back is the host your own webinar. So if you host a public webinar and collaborate, um, you can do that here. You can nominate a featured teacher by filling out the form at tinyurl.com slash CR2O Live Feature Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. You can even nominate yourself for the Feature Teacher of the Month. As you exit the room, as you exit the show, your browser should open the link for the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. The survey link will also be in the chat. If you're watching this as a recording, you can get the link as well for, for watching the recording. Um, the survey is also in the live binder, so there are many places to get the survey for the show. As you complete the survey, to, at the bottom you'll find information to request a professional development certificate. Please, if you do that, make sure your email address is a personal one rather than a school email. Sometimes school email addresses will block this, and please be careful of the spelling of your name and your address as well. Um, so you can request a uh, PD certificate. All of the recordings are at Live iTunes U. There's a video collection and audio collection there as well. And on the Classroom 2.0 Live website, you can also follow the RSS feed for the show archives. So there are many, many ways to, to find the archives for, for the shows.
We want to give special thanks to Vicki Davis, our special guest for today, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you for spending your time on a Saturday with us today. We can keep the recording running and ask more questions if that's okay. Well, how many how many do we have? I'm happy to answer if there's some that need to be asked, but um, you know, I try to. I mean, I could take one or two, but pretty much, uh, you know, why don't we do okay. this? Those who want to leave, you can go ahead and leave. It won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> we'll see how many we have left who have burning questions that have to be answered, and I'll, I'll answer the burning questions. And you could just, uh, I guess, you can leave the recorder going. Who do we have? Oh, one question that someone wanted asked at the end. Are you speaking anywhere this summer, Vicki? Yeah, if you go to my blog, you can see my events. I'm going to go to Louisville, Kentucky. I'll be at ISTE for two sessions. I've got a great session I'm moderating on Genius Hour with Sylvia Martinez and um, Angela Myers and Don Wetrick. It's going to be fantastic. I don't know how much I'll be talking to that session. I think I'll be sitting there open mouthed. <laughs> Um, I'm actually going to go to the Jostens thing in Orlando, and I've got a, a thing coming up in August. So they're all on my calendar. You can kind of see. And I'm, I only do four or five um, keynotes during the school year. So um, I'm getting pretty close. I'm getting booked, but not quite. I've got two or three slots open. So if you know a conference and want to try to get me, now's the time, because I'm hoping to be booked by the end of June, I hope. Great. Thank you. I think we'll stop the recording here then. Sure. Okay, are we done?